Chapter 1 of Music Notation and Terminology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Music Notation and Terminology by Carl Wilson Gerkens. Chapter 1 Some Principles of Correct Notation. 1. The note from nota, Latin, a mark or sign, consists of either one, two, or three parts, these being referred to respectively as head, stem, and hook. The hook is often called tail or cross-stroke. The stem appears on the right side of the head when turned up, but on the left side when turned down. Begin footnote. It should be noted at the outset that this statement regarding the downturned stem on the left side of the note head and also a number of similar principles here cited, refer more specifically to music as it appears on the printed page. In the case of hand-copied music, the downturned stem appears on the right side of the note, thus. And here's a picture of a downturned stem on a note. This is done because of greater facility in writing, and for the same reason other slight modifications of the notation here recommended may sometimes be encountered. In dealing with children, it is best usually to follow as closely as possible the principles according to which printed music is notated, in order to avoid those non-satisfying and often embarrassing explanations of differences which will otherwise be unavoidable. End footnote. The hook is always on the right side. Begin footnote. An exception to this rule occurs in the case of notes of unequal value stroked together, when the hook appears on the left side, thus, and here's an illustration of notes stroked together with a hook on the left. End footnote. In writing music with pen, the head and hook are best made with a heavy pressure on the pen point, but in writing at the board they are most easily made by using a piece of chalk, about an inch long, turned on its side. 2. When only one part or voice is written on the staff, the following rules for turning stems apply. 1. If the note head is below the third line, the stem must turn up. 2. If the note head is above the third line, the stem must turn down. 3. If the note head is on the third line, the stem is turned either up or down, with due regard to the symmetrical appearance of the measure in which the note occurs. The following examples will illustrate these points. Figure 1 3. When two parts are written on the same staff, the stems of the upper part all turn up, and those of the lower part turn down, in order that the parts may be clearly distinguished. Figure 2 but in music for piano and other instruments, on which complete chords can be sounded by one performer, and also in simple four-part vocal music, in which all voices have approximately the same rhythm, several notes often have one stem in common, as in figure three. Figure two. Figure three. Four. Notes of small denomination, eighths or smaller, are often written in groups of two or more, all stems in the group being then connected by one cross-stroke. In such a case all the stems must of course be turned the same way, the direction being determined by the position of the majority of note-heads in the group. Notes thus stroked may be of the same or of different denomination. See figure four. Figure four. In vocal music, notes are never thus stroked when a syllable is given to each note. See page 19, section 55, C. 5. Rests, like notes, are best made with a heavy pen stroke or by using a piece of chalk on its side. See note under section 1. The double whole rest, whole rest, and half rest 
occupy the third space unless for the sake of clearness in writing two parts on the same staff, they are written higher or lower. The rests of smaller denomination may be placed at any point on the staff, the hooks being always placed on the spaces. The hook of the eighth rest is usually placed on the third space. Rests are sometimes dotted, but are never tied. 6. The G clef should be begun at the second line rather than below the staff. Experiments have shown clearly that beginners learn to make it most easily in this way, and the process may be further simplified by dividing it into two parts, thus. Here's an illustration of the curvy line of a G clef next to the vertical straight line. The descending stroke crosses the ascending curve at or near the fourth line. The circular part of the curve occupies approximately the first and second spaces. 7. The F clef is made either thus, illustration of a regular F clef, or thus, illustration of a more swirly fancy F clef, the dots being placed one on either side of the fourth line of the staff, which is the particular point that the clef marks. The C clef has also two forms illustration of one type of C-clef, and illustration of the other type. 8. The sharp is made with two light vertical strokes, and two heavy slanting ones, the slant of the latter being upward from left to right. Illustration of a properly drawn sharp symbol. The sharp should never be made thus. Illustration of a regular number symbol. The double sharp is made either thus, an X, or an asterisk, the first form being at present the more common. 9. The flat is best made by a downstroke retraced part way up, the curve being made without lifting pen from paper. The double flat consists of two flats. Begin footnote. It is to be hoped that the figure for the double flat suggested by Matheson, who also suggested the St. Andrew's cross for the double sharp, may sometime be readopted. This figure was the Greek letter B, made thus, it looks like a German S Z, and its use would make our notation one degree more uniform than it is at present. End footnote. The natural, or cancel, is made in two strokes, downright and right down, thus. Illustration of the components of a natural sign. 10. The tie usually connects the heads of notes, thus. Illustration of two notes connected by a tie. 11. The dot after a note always appears on a space, whether the note head is on a line or space. See figure 5. In the case of a dot after a note on a line, the dot usually appears on the space above that line if the next note is higher in position and on the space below it if the following note is lower. Figure 5. Note. Correct notation must be made a habit rather than a theory, and in order to form the habit of writing correctly, drill is necessary. This may perhaps be best secured by asking students to write, at the board or on ruled paper, from verbal dictation, thus, teacher says, Key of B flat, three quarter measure. First measure, do, a quarter note, re, a quarter, and mi, a quarter. Second measure, sol, a quarter, la, a quarter, and sol, a quarter. Third measure, la, ti, do, re, mi, eighths, stroked in pairs. Fourth measure, hi, do, a dotted half. Pupils respond by writing the exercise dictated, after which mistakes in the turning of stems, etc., are corrected. The pitch names may be dictated instead of the syllables if desired, and still further practice may be provided by asking that the exercise be transposed to other keys. End of chapter 1. Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, on July 31, 2009, in San Diego, California.
Chapter 2 of Music Notation and Terminology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thovo. Music Notation and Terminology by Carl Wilson Gerkins. Chapter 2 Symbols of Music Defined. 12. A staff is a collection of parallel lines, together with the spaces belonging to them. The modern staff has five lines and six spaces, these being ordinarily referred to as first line, second line, third line, fourth line, and fifth line, beginning with the lowest, and space below, that is, space below the first line, first space, second space, third space, fourth space, and space above. The definition and discussion above refer more specifically to one of the portions of the great staff, the latter term being often applied to the combination of treble and bass staffs, with one ledger line between, so commonly used in piano music, etc. 13. The extent of the staff may be increased either above or below by the addition of short lines called ledger lines. Begin footnote. The word ledger is derived from the French word léger, meaning light, and this use of the word refers to the fact that the ledger lines, being added by hand, are lighter, that is, less solid in color, than the printed lines of the staff itself. End footnote. And notes may be written on either these lines or on the spaces above and below them. 14. The lines and spaces constituting the staff, including ledger lines if any, are often referred to as staff degrees. That is, each separate line and space is considered to be a degree of the staff. The tones of a scale are also sometimes referred to as degrees of the scale. 15. A clef. Begin footnote. The word clef is derived from clavis, a key, the reference being to the fact that the clef unlocks or makes clear the meaning of the staff, as a key to a puzzle enables us to solve the puzzle. End footnote. A clef is a sign placed on the staff to designate what pitches are to be represented by its lines and spaces. Thus, for example, the G clef shows us not only that the second line of the staff represents G, but that the first line represents E, the first space F, etc. The F clef similarly shows us that the fifth line of the bass staff represents the first A below middle C the fourth line, the first F below middle C, etc. The student should note that these clefts are merely modified forms of the letters G and F, which, among others, were used to designate the pitches represented by certain lines when staff notation was first inaugurated. For a fuller discussion of this matter, see Appendix A, page 101. 16. When the G clef is used, the staff is usually referred to as the treble staff, and when the F clef is used, as the bass staff. Such expressions as singing from the treble clef, or singing in the treble clef, and singing in the bass clef, are still frequently heard, but are preferably replaced by singing from the treble staff and singing from the bass staff. Figure 6 shows the permanent names of lines and spaces when the G and F clefs are used. Begin footnote. The Germans use the same pitch designations as we do, with two exceptions. That is to say, our B is called by them H, and our B flat is called B. The scale of C therefore reads C, D, E, F, G, A, H, C. The scale of F reads F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F. The signatures are in all cases written exactly as we write them. 
in france and italy where the fixed dose system is in vogue pitches are usually referred to by the syllable names for example c is referred to as do or ut d as re etc end footnote 17 the movable c cliff and there's an illustration of a type of c cliff or another type of c cliff formerly in very common use is now utilized for only two purposes namely one in music written for certain orchestral instruments cello viola etc of extended range in order to avoid having to use too many ledger lines and two for indicating the tenor part in vocal music this latter usage seems also to be disappearing however and the tenor part is commonly written on the treble staff it being understood that the tones are to be sung an octave lower than the notes would indicate the c clef as used in its various positions is shown in figures seven eight and nine it will be noted that in each case the line on which the clef is placed represents middle c eighteen a sharp is a character which causes the degree of the staff with which it is associated to represent a pitch one half step higher than it otherwise would thus in figure ten a the fifth line and first space represent the pitch f but in figure ten b these same staff degrees represent an entirely different tone f sharp the student should note that the sharp does not then raise anything it merely causes a staff degree to represent a higher tone than it otherwise would there's just as much difference between f and f sharp as between b and c and yet one would never think of referring to c as b raised nineteen a flat is a character that causes the degree of the staff with which it is associated to represent a tone one half step lower than it otherwise would see note under section eighteen and apply the same discussion here twenty a double sharp causes the staff degree on which it is placed to represent a pitch one whole step higher than it would without any sharp similarly a double flat causes the staff degree on which it is placed to represent a pitch one whole step lower than it would without any flat double sharps and double flats are generally used on staff degrees that have already been sharped or flatted therefore their practical effect is to cause staff degrees to represent pitches respectively a half step higher and a half step lower than would be represented by those same degrees in their diatonic condition thus in figure ten b the first space in its diatonic condition begin footnote the expression diatonic condition as here used refers to the staff after the signature has been placed upon it in other words after the staff has been prepared to represent the pitches of the diatonic scale End footnote represents f sharp and the double sharp on this degree would cause it to represent a pitch one half step higher than f sharp that is f double sharp end of chapter two recording by thovo december thirteenth two thousand nine of music notation and terminology this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org music notation and terminology by carl w gherkins chapter three symbols of music defined continued twenty one the natural begin footnote it has already been noted page six note that in the german scale our b flat is called b and our b is called h from this difference in terminology has grown up the custom of using the h now made natural sign to show that any staff degree is in natural condition i e not sharped or flatted and footnote sometimes called cancel annuls the effect of previous sharps 
flats, double sharps, and double flats within the measure in which it occurs. After a double sharp or double flat, the combination of a natural with a sharp or a natural with a flat is often found. In this case, only one sharp or flat is annulled. Sometimes also the single sharp or flat will be found by itself cancelling the double sharp or double flat. The natural is often used when a composition changes key, as in figure 11, where a key from each G is shown. 22. The group of sharps or flats, or absence of them, at the beginning of a staff partially indicates the key in which the composition is written. They are called collectively the key signature. 23. The same key signature may stand for either one of two keys, the major key or its relative minor. Hence, in order to determine in what key a melody is in, one must note whether the tones are grouped around the major tonic do or the minor tonic la. In a harmonized composition, it is almost always possible to determine the key by referring to the last bass note. If the final chord is clearly the do chord, the composition is in the major key. But if this final chord is clearly the la chord, then it is almost certain that the entire composition is in the minor key. Thus, if a final chord appears, as that in figure 12, the composition is clearly in G major, while if it appears, as in figure 13, it is just as surely in E minor. 24. Sharps, flats, naturals, double sharps, and double flats, occurring in the course of the composition, i.e. after the key signature, are called accidentals, whether they actually cause a staff degree to represent a different pitch, as in figure 14, or simply make clear a notation about which there might otherwise be some doubt, as in figure 15, measure 2. The effect of such accidentals terminates at the bar. Twenty-five. In the case of a tie across a bar, an accidental remains in force until the combined value of the tied notes expires. In figure 16, first measure, third beat, an accidental sharp makes the third space represent the pitch C-sharp. By virtue of the tie across the bar, the third space continues to represent C-sharp through the first beat of the second measure. But, for the remainder of the measure, the third space will represent C, unless the sharp is repeated, as in figure 17. 26. The following rules for making staff degrees represent pitches different from those of the diatonic scale will be found useful by the beginner in the study of musical notation. These rules are quoted from the Worcester Musical Manual by Charles I. Rice. 1. To sharp a natural degree, use a sharp. Figure 18. 2. To sharp a sharp degree, use a double sharp. Figure 19. 3. To sharp a flatted degree, use a natural. Figure 20. 4. To flat a natural degree, use a flat. Figure 21. 5. To flat a flatted degree, use a double flat. Figure 22. 6. To flat a sharp degree, use a natural. Figure 23. 27. When two different notations represent the same pitch, the word and harmonic is applied. Thus we may say that F-sharp and G-flats, on keyboard instruments at least, are enharmonically the same. The word enharmonic is used in such expressions as enharmonic change, enharmonic keys, enharmonic interval, enharmonic modulation, enharmonic relation, etc. And in all such combinations, it has the same meaning that is, a change in notation, but no change in the pitch represented. 28. A note is a character expressing relative duration, which, when placed on a staff, indicates that a certain tone is to be sounded for a certain relative length of time. The pitch of the tone to be sounded is shown by the position of the note on the staff, while the length of the time it is to be prolonged is shown by the shape of the note. 
Thus, example, a half note on the second line of the treble staff indicates that a specific pitch, G, is to be played or sung for a period of time twice as long as would be indicated by a quarter note in the same composition. 29. A rest is a character which indicates a rhythmic silence of a certain relative length. 30. The notes and rests in common use are as follows. Whole note. An open note head without stem. Half note. An open note head with stem. Quarter note. A closed note head with stem. Eighth note. A closed note head with stem and one hook. Sixteenth note. A closed note head with stem and two hooks. Thirty-second note. A closed note head with stem and three hooks. Whole rest. Half rest. Quarter rest. Eighth rest. Sixteenth rest. And thirty-second rest. Thirty-one. The English names for these notes are whole note, semi breve, half note, minim, quarter note, crochet, eighth note, quaver, sixteenth note, semi quaver, thirty second note, demi semi quaver. The corresponding rests are referred to by the same system of nomenclature, example, semi breve rest, etc. thirty two. Sixty four and one hundred and twenty eighth notes are occasionally found but are not in common use. The double whole note, breve, made, picture of double whole note, or another picture of a double whole note, is still used, especially in English music, which frequently employs the half note as a beat unit. Thus, in four half measures, the breve would be necessary to indicate a tone having four beats. 33. The whole rest has a peculiarity of usage not common to any other duration symbol. That is, it is often employed as a measure rest, filling an entire measure of beats, no matter what the measure signature may be. Thus, not only in four-quarter measures, but in two-quarter, three-quarter, six-eighths, and other varieties, the whole rest fills the entire measure, having a value sometimes greater, sometimes less than the corresponding whole note. Because of this peculiarity of usage, the whole rest is termed Taktpasa, measure rest, by the Germans. 34. A bar is a vertical line across the staff, dividing it into measures. The word bar is often used synonymously with measure by orchestral conductors and others, thus being at the fourteenth bar after J. This use of the word, although popular, is incorrect. 35. A double bar consists of two vertical lines across the staff, at least one of the two being a heavy line. The double bar marks the end of a division, movement, or entire composition. End of chapter 3music notation and terminology this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jennifer stearns music notation and terminology by carl wilson kirkins chapter 4 abbreviations signs etc 36 a double bar or single heavy bar with either two or four dots, indicates that a section is to be repeated. If the repeat marks occur at only one point, the entire preceding part is to be repeated. But if the marks occur twice, the first time at the right of the bar, but the second time at the left, only the section thus enclosed by the marks is to be repeated. 37. Sometimes a different cadence or ending is to be used for the repetition, and this is indicated as in figure 24. 38. The Italian word bis is occasionally used to indicate that a certain passage or section is to be repeated. This use is becoming obsolete. 39. The words da capo, dc, mean literally from the head, namely, repeat from the beginning. The words da segno, ds, indicate a repetition from the sign, s with squiggly line instead of from the beginning. In the case of both DC and DS, the word fine, meaning literally the end, is ordinarily used to designate the point at which the repeated section is to terminate. The fermata was formerly in common use for the same purpose, but is seldom so employed at present. DC, sign, footnote. The word sign 
is a contraction of the Italian word sino, meaning as far as or until. In the term given above, it is really superfluous, as the word al includes in itself both preposition and article, meaning to the. End footnote. Al fine means repeat from the beginning to the word fine. DC al fermata means repeat to the fermata or hold. DC senza repetizione or DC ma senza repetizione both mean repeat from the beginning but without observing other repeat marks during the repetition. DC e poi la coda means repeat the first section only to the mark circle with a cross through it, then skip to the coda. See page 74, section 157, for discussion of coda. 40. In certain cases, where the repetition of characteristic figures can be indicated without causing confusion, it is the practice of composers, especially in orchestral music, to make use of certain signs of repetition. Some of the commonest of these abbreviations are shown in the following examples. In figure 28, the repetition of an entire measure is called for. <music> 41. The word simile, sometimes segue, indicates that a certain effect previously begun is to be continued, as, for example, staccato playing, pedaling, style of bowing in violin music, etc. The word segue is also occasionally used to show that an accompaniment figure, especially in orchestral music, is to be continued. 42. When some part is to rest for two or more measures, several methods of notation are possible. A rest of two measures is usually indicated thus, bar over the third line, three measures thus, two bars over the third line, with three above, four measures thus, a bar over the, the second and third space, with a four above. Rests of more than four measures are usually indicated in one of the following ways. Lines throughout the middle of the staff, with the number of rests above. Sometimes the number of measures is written directly on the staff thus. Number right in the staff. 43. The letters GP, general pause, or grosse pause, the words lunga pausa, or simply the word lunga, are sometimes written over a rest to show that there is to be a prolonged pause or rest in all parts. Such expressions are found only in ensemble music, namely, music in which several performers are engaged at the same time. 44. The fermata, or hold, an arch with a dot under it, over a note or chord, indicates that the tone is to be prolonged, the duration of the prolongation depending upon the character of the music and the taste of the performer or conductor. It has already been noted that the hold, over a bar, was formerly used to designate the end of the composition as the word fine is employed at present. But this usage has practically disappeared, and the hold over the bar now usually indicates a short rest between two sections of a composition. 45. The sign 8VA, an abbreviation of al octava, literally at the octave, above the staff, indicates that all tones are to be sounded an octave higher than the notes would indicate. When found below the staff, the same sign serves to indicate that the tones are to be sounded an octave lower. The term 8VA basa has also this latter signification. 43. Sometimes the word loco, in place, is used to show that the part is no longer to be sounded an octave higher, or lower, but this is more often indicated by the termination of the dotted or wavy line. 47. The sign col 8, col octava, with the octave, shows that the tones, an octave higher or lower, are to be sounded with the tones indicated by the printed notes. 48. For the sake of definiteness in referring to pitches, a particular name is applied to each octave, and all pitches in the octave are referred to by means of a uniform nomenclature. The following figure will make the system clear. Thus, for example, great G, written simply G, is a G represented by the first line of the bass staff, small a, written lowercase a, is represented by the fifth line of the bass staff. Two-line g, written g with two lines, is represented by the space above the fifth line, treble staff. 
three-lined C, written C with three lines above it, is represented by the second added line above the treble staff, etc. The one-lined octave may be described as the octave from middle C to the B represented by the third line of the treble staff, and any tone within that octave is referred to as one-lined. Thus, one-line D, one-line G, etc. In scientific works on acoustics, etc., the pitches in the sub-octave, or sub-contra-octave, as it is often called, are referred to as C subscript 2, D subscript 2, E subscript 2, etc. Those in the contra-octave as C subscript 1, D subscript 1, etc. In the great octave as C superscript 1, D superscript 1, etc. In the small octave as C superscript 2, D superscript 2, etc. End of chapter 4 Recording by Jennifer Stearns, Concord, New Hampshire Chapter 5 of Music Notation and Terminology This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Music Notation and Terminology by Carl Wilson Gherkins Read and recorded by Sandra Chapter 5 Abbreviations, signs, etc. continued. 49. A dot after a note shows that the value of the note is to be half again as great as it would be without the dot, i.e. the value is to be three halves that of the original note. 50. When two dots follow the note, the second dot adds half as much as the first dot has added, i.e. the entire value is seven-fourths that of the original note. 51. When three dots follow the note, the third dot adds one-half the value added by the second, i.e. the entire value of the triple-dotted note is fifteen-eighths that of the original note. 52. A dot over or under a note is called the staccato mark and indicates that the tone is to be sounded and then instantly released. In music for organ and for some other instruments, the staccato note is sometimes interpreted differently, this depending on the character of the instrument. On stringed instruments of the violin family, the staccato effect is usually secured by a long, rapid stroke of the bow for each tone. In the case of harp and drum, the hand is quickly brought into contact with the vibrating body, thus stopping the tone instantly. On the organ, the tone is often prolonged to one-half the value of the printed note, before the keys are released. 53. The wedge-shaped dash over the note, staccatissimo, was formerly employed to indicate a tone still more detached than that indicated by the dot. But this sign is really superfluous and is seldom used at present. 54. A tie is a curved line connecting the heads of two notes that call for the same tone. It indicates that they are to be sounded as one tone, having a duration equal to the combination value of both notes. E.g. A half note tied to a quarter note would indicate a tone equal in duration length to that shown by a dotted half note. Two half notes tied would indicate a tone equal in duration to that shown by a whole note. See examples under sections 49, 50, and 51. Figure 30 illustrates the more common variety of tie, while figure 31 shows an example of the enharmonic tie. Footnote 10 for definition of enharmonic, see page 10, 
Section 27 55 The slur is used in so many different ways that it is impossible to give a general definition. It consists of a curved line, sometimes very short, in which case it looks like the tie, but sometimes very long, connecting ten, fifteen or more notes. Some of the more common uses of the slur are a. To indicate a legato, sustained or connecting tones, as contrasted with staccato, detached ones. In violin music, this implies playing all tones thus slurred in one bow. In music for the voice and for wind instruments, it implies singing or playing them in one breath. b. As a phrase mark, in the interpretation of which the first tone of the phrase is often accented slightly and the last one shortened in the value. This interpretation of the phrase is especially common when the phrase is short, as in the two-note phrase, and when the tones constituting the phrase are quite short duration, e.g. the phrase given in figure 32, would be played approximately as written in figure 33. But if the notes are of greater value, especially in slow tempi, the slur merely indicates legato, i.e. sustained or connected rendition. Figure 34 illustrates such a case. This is a matter of such diverse usage that it is difficult to generalise regarding it. The tendency seems at present to be in the direction of using the slur in instrumental music as a phrase mark exclusively, it being understood that unless there is some direction to the contrary, the tones are to be performed in a connected manner. C. In vocal music, to show that two or more tones are to be sung to one syllable of text, See figure 35. Figure 35. Mendelssohn, St. Paul. Remember his children. In notes of small denomination, eighths or smaller, the same thing is often indicated by stroking the stems together as in figure 36. Ever and ever and ever and... This can only be done in cases where the natural grouping of notes in the measure will not be destroyed. D. To mark the special note groups, triplets, etc., in which case the slur is accompanied by a figure indicating the number of notes in the group. See figure 37a. A. The most common of these irregular note groups is the triplet, which consists of three notes to be performed in the time ordinarily given to two of the same value. Sometimes the triplet consists of only two notes, as in figure 37b. B. B. In such a case, the first two of the three notes composing the triplet are considered to be tied. When the triplet form is perfectly obvious, the figure three, as well as the slur, may be omitted. Other examples of irregular note groups, together with the names commonly applied, follow. Doublet, quintuplet or quintlet. Sextuplet or sextolet. 
septillate or septimal. 56. The combination of slur or tie and dots over the notes indicates that the tones are to be somewhat detached, but not sharply so. This effect is sometimes erroneously termed portamento, lit, carrying, but this term is more properly reserved for an entirely different effect, viz. when a singer or player on a stringed instrument passes from one high tone to a low one, or vice versa, touching lightly on some or all of the diatonic tones between the two melody tones. 57. The horizontal dash over a note indicates that the tone is to be slightly accented and sustained. This mark is also sometimes used after a staccato passage to show that the tones are no longer to be performed in detached fashion, but are to be sustained. This latter use is especially common in music for stringed instruments. 58. The combination of dash and dot over a note indicates that the tone is to be slightly accented and separated from its neighbouring tones. 59. Accent marks are made in a variety of fashions. The most common forms follow. Horizontal accent symbol. Vertical accent symbol. SF, FZ. All indicate that a certain tone or chord is to be differentiated from its neighbouring tones or chords by receiving a certain relative amount of stress. 60. In music for keyboard instruments, it is sometimes necessary to indicate that a certain part is to be played by a certain hand. The abbreviations RH, right hand, MD, mano destra, Italian, and MD, main droite, French, designate that a passage or tone is to be played with the right hand while LH, left hand, MS, mano sinistra, Italian, and MG, main gauche, French, show that the left hand is to be employed. 61. The wavy line placed vertically beside a chord indicates that the tones are to be sounded consecutively instead of simultaneously beginning with the lowest tone, all tones being sustained until the duration value of the chord has expired. This is called arpeggio playing. When the wavy line extends through the entire chord, covering both staffs, as in figure 38, all the tones of the chord are to be played one after another, beginning with the lowest, But if there is a separate wavy line for each staff, as at figure 39, then the lowest tone represented on the upper staff is to be played simultaneously with the lowest tone represented on the bass staff. The word arpeggio, plural arpeggi, is a derivation of the Italian word arpa, meaning harp, and from this word arpa, and its corresponding verb arpeggiare, to play on the harp, are derived also a number of other terms commonly used in instrumental music. Among these are arpeggiamento, arpeggiando, arpeggiato, etc. All of these terms, referring to a harp style of performance, the tones being sounded one after another in rapid succession, instead of simultaneously as on the piano. 62. The sign crescendo, decrescendo symbol, over a note, indicates that the tone is to be begun softly, gradually increased in power, and as gradually decreased again, ending as softly as it began. In vocal music, this effect is called messa di voce. 63. 
In music for stringed instruments of the violin family, the sign down bow symbol, like an upside down V, indicates down bow, and the sign up bow symbol, like a V, indicates up bow. In cello music, the down bow sign is sometimes written cello down bow symbol, like two vertical lines with a thick horizontal line joining them at the top. End of chapter 5。Chapter 6 of Music Notation and Terminology。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Stearns. Music Notation and Terminology. By Carl Wilson Gerkins. Chapter 6. Embellishments. 64. Embellishments, or graces. French, agrément. Are ornamental tones, either represented in full, in the score, or indicated by certain signs. The following are the embellishments most commonly found. Trill, or shake. Mordant, inverted mordant or prowl trill, turn, grappetto, inverted turn, appoggiatura, and axiacator. Usage varies greatly in the interpretation of the signs representing these embellishments, and it is impossible to give examples of all the different forms. The following definitions represent, therefore, only the most commonly found examples and the most generally accepted interpretations. 65. The trill, or shake, consists of the rapid alternation of two tones to the full value of the printed note. The lower of these two tones is represented by the printed note, while the upper one is the next higher tone in the diatonic scale of the key in which the composition is written. The interval between the two tones may therefore be either a half step or a whole step. Whether the trill is to begin with the principal tone represented by the printed note, or with the one above, is a matter of some dispute among theorists and performers, but it may safely be said that the majority of modern writers on the subject would have it begun on the principal tone rather than on the tone above. Figure 40. When the principal tone is preceded by a small note on the degree above, it is of course understood that the trill begins on the tone above. Figure 41. The trill is indicated by the sign TR squiggly line. The above examples would be termed perfect trills because they close with a turn. By inference, an imperfect trill is one closing without a turn. 66. The mordant consists of three tones. First, the one represented by the printed note. Second, the one next below it in the diatonic scale. Third, the one represented by the printed note again. Figure 42. 67. The double or long mordant has five tones, sometimes seven, instead of three. The first two of the three tones of the regular mordant being repeated once or more. See figure 43. In the case of both mordant and double mordant, the tones are sounded as quickly as possible, the time taken by the embellishment being subtracted from the value of the principal note as printed. 68. The inverted mordant, note the absence of the vertical line, is like the mordant except that the tone below is replaced by the tone above in each case. This ornament is sometimes called a transient shake because it is really only a part of the more elaborate grace called trill. See figure 44. The confusion at present attending the interpretation of the last two embellishments described might be largely obviated if the suggestion of a recent writer, begin footnote, Elson, Dictionary of Music, Article, Mordant, end footnote, to call the one the upward mordant, and the other the downward mordant, were to be universally adopted. 69. The turn consists of four tones. First, the diatonic scale tone, above the principal tone. 
second, the principal tone itself, third, the tone below the principal tone, and fourth, the principal tone again. When the sign occurs over a note of small value in rapid tempo, figure 45, the turn consists of four tones of equal value, but if it occurs over a note of greater value, or in a slow tempo, the tones are usually played quickly, like the mordant, and the fourth tone is then held until the time value of the note has expired. Figure 46. 70. When the turn sign is placed a little to the right of the note, the principal tone is sounded first and held to almost its full time value, then the turn is played just before the next tone of the melody. In this case, the four tones are of equal length as in the first example. See figure 47. The student should note the difference between these two effects. In the case of a turn over, the note the turn comes at the beginning, but in the case of the sign after the note, the turn comes at the very end. But in both cases the time taken by the embellishment is taken from the time value of the principal note. For further details, see Grove's Dictionary of Music and Musicians, Volume 5, page 184. Also, Elson, Opus Satanum, page 274. 71. Sometimes an accidental occurs with the turn, and in this case, when written above the sign, it refers to the highest tone of the turn, but when written below, to the lowest. Figure 48. 72. In the inverted turn, the order of tones is reversed, the lowest one coming first, the principal tone next, the highest tone third, and the principal tone again last. Figure 49. 73. The appoggiatura, lit, leaning note, consists of an ornamental tone introduced before a tone of a melody, thus delaying the melody tone until the ornamental tone has been heard. The time taken for this ornamental tone is taken from that of the melody tone. The appoggiatura was formerly classified into long appoggiatura and short appoggiatura but modern writers seem to consider that the term short appoggiatura to be synonymous with acciaccatura. Begin footnote. In organ music, the acciaccatura is still taken to mean that the embellishing tone and the melody tone are to be sounded together, the former being then instantly released, while the latter is held to its full time value. End footnote. And to avoid confusion, the word Achiacator will be used in this sense and defined under its own heading. 74. Three rules for the interpretation of the appoggiatura are commonly cited, namely, 1. When it is possible to divide the principal tone into halves, then the appoggiatura receives one half the value of the printed note. Figure 50. 2. When the principal note is dotted, division into halves being therefore not possible, the appoggiatura receives two-thirds of the value, figure 51. 3. When the principal note is tied to a note of smaller denomination, the appoggiatura receives the value of the first of the two notes, figure 52. 75. The acciaccatura, or short appoggiatura, is written like the appoggiatura, except that it has a light stroke across its stem. It has no definite duration value, but is sounded as quickly as possible, taking its time from that of the principal tone. The appoggiatura is always accented, but the acciaccatura never is, the stress always falling on the melody tone. See Grove, Opus Citatum, Volume 1, page 96. The use of embellishments is on the wane, and the student of today needs the above information only to aid him in the interpretation of music written in previous centuries. In the early days of instrumental music, it was necessary to introduce graces of all sorts because the instruments in use were not capable of sustaining tone for any length of time. But with the advent of the modern piano, with its comparatively great sustaining power, and also with the advent in vocal music of a new style of singing, 
German leader singing as contrasted with Italian coloratura singing, ornamental tones were used less and less, and when found now are usually written out in full in the score instead of being indicated by signs. End of chapter 6 Recording by Jennifer Stearns, Concord, New Hampshire The Preface of Music Notation and Terminology This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Miriam Esther Goldman Music Notation and Terminology by Carl Wilson Gerkins The Preface The study of music notation and terminology by classes in conservatories and in music departments of colleges and normal schools is a comparative innovation, one reason for the non-existence of such courses in the past being the lack of a suitable textbook, in which might be found in related groups clear and accurate definitions of the really essential terms. But with the constantly increasing interest in music study, both private and in the public schools, and with the present persistent demand that music teaching shall become more systematic and therefore more efficient in turning out a more intelligent class of pupils, it has become increasingly necessary to establish courses in which the prospective teacher of music, after having had considerable experience with music itself, might acquire a concise and accurate knowledge of a fairly large number of terms, most of which he has probably already encountered as a student, and many of which he knows the general meaning of, but none of which he perhaps knows accurately enough to enable him to impart his knowledge clearly and economically to others. To meet the need of a textbook for this purpose in his own classes, the author has been for several years gathering materials from all available sources, and it is hoped that the arrangement of this material in related groups as here presented will serve to give the student not only some insight into the present meaning of a goodly number of terms, but will also enable him to see more clearly why certain terms have the meaning which at present attaches to them. To this latter end the derivations of many of the terms are given in connection with their definition. The aim has not been to present an exhaustive list. And the selection of terms has, of course, been influenced largely by the author's own individual experience. Hence, many teachers will probably feel that important terms have been omitted, that should have been included. For this state of affairs, no apology is offered, except that it would probably be impossible to write a book on this subject which would satisfy everyone in either the selection or actual definition of terms. In formulating the definitions themselves, an attempt has been made to use such words as note, tone, etc., with at least a fair degree of accuracy. And while the attitude of the author on this point may be criticized as being puristic and pedantic, it is nevertheless his opinion that the next generation of music students and teachers will be profited by a more accurate use of certain terms that have been inaccurately used for so long that the present generation has to a large extent lost sight of the fact that the use is inaccurate. The author is well aware of the fact that reform is a matter of growth rather than of edict, but he is also of the belief that before reform can actually begin to come, the need of reform must be felt by a fairly large number of actively interested persons. It is precisely because so few musicians realize the need of any change in music terminology that the changes recommended by committees who have given the matter careful thought are so slow in being adopted. It is hoped that some few points at which reform in the terminology of music is necessary may be brought to the attention of a few additional musicians through this volume, and that the cause may thus be helped in some slight degree. It is suggested that in using the book for classroom purposes, the teacher emphasize not only the definition and derivation of all terms studied, but the spelling and pronunciation as well. For this latter purpose, a pronouncing index has been appended. It is impossible to give credit to all sources from which ideas have been drawn, but a special mention should be made of the eminently clear and beautifully worded definitions compiled by Professor Waldo S. Pratt, or the Century Dictionary, 
and the exceedingly valuable articles on an almost all-inclusive range of topics found in the new edition of Grove's Dictionary. A special thanks for valuable suggestions as to the arrangement of the material, etc., are also due to Dr. Raymond H. Stetson, Professor of Psychology, Oberlin College, Arthur E. Hecox, Professor of Theory, Oberlin Conservatory of Music, and Charles I. Rice, Supervisor of Music, Worcester, Massachusetts, as well as to various members of the Music Teachers National Association who have offered valuable advice along certain specific lines. KWG Oberlin Conservatory of Music, June 1913 End of the Preface Recording by Miriam Esther Goldman